What is the greatest art robbery in history? Some would say it's the Mona Lisa being stolen and then two years later being sold back to a gallery in Florence. If you're an artist, you might say the Ghent altarpiece, one of the first masterwork oil paintings ever made. That was stolen by Napoleon in the 1790s. And only 90 years later, the subject of our story is looking at that very painting. That person had already bore the tragedy of the greatest art robbery in history. Our painter marveled at the Ghent altarpiece like no other painting, and the altarpiece marveled back at the greatest master who had come from nothing but the rolling hills of Meuse, France, where the rich soils can only afford to grow themselves a master artist once every few hundred years, the last of which was in the 15th century. Long overdue of spreading its culture to the world, the town of Danvieres breathed its first breath of fresh air again in 1856. The occasional tree broke the light from the endless fields of potatoes and hay. The hundreds of peasants worked the agrarian lifestyle day and night. The wood gatherers collected their bundles. The fishermen waded through streams or tackle on their shoulders, and their women washed the clothes at the edges. Life here was exhaustingly stable. But a young boy was building the foundation that he would stand on for the rest of his life. That boy's name was Jules Bastien Lepage. Him, his mother, father, and grandfather lived off of the land that they tilled. Jules's father showed him the calm, understanding observation of nature, instructing him to draw lamps and inkstands and jugs out of his home. It was in this mundane that the Lepage family found beauty, honoring a sincere and accurate representation of life to be the most endearing. But it was never a good idea to make an artist out of your son. Better he goes to college and becomes a government worker, finding a secure and stable paycheck. And that's what Jules did. He went to college, but even there he managed to find himself some drawing instruction, even impressing his master with how accurate he was in representing nature. Lepage represented everything that stuck to him with a pencil. His first composition was on Abraham's sacrifice. It was in these classical and religious stories that he could get away from home and find something exciting. But upon completion of college, Lepage couldn't take it anymore. His life was meant to be a painter, and so he he told his parents his wishes to move to Paris. Of course, his family did not want that, but his father got him a job in Paris working for the postal office, and he could study at the French Academy of Fine Art in his off time. Lepage is diligent in his new job at the postal office, but it drains his soul balancing the two, and soon he burns his bridges and leaves the postal office, and he finds himself in the whirlpool of Paris, alone with no means of support. But Lepage finds his legs in the studio of Cabanel, and he has a sense of never-ending cheerfulness and self-assurance that brings him through life despite being surrounded by the ever-present risk of failure. After two years of studying, Lepage unveils his first portrait in the salon, and it goes wholly unnoticed. He receives no awards, and not long after, the Franco-Prussian War breaks out and Paris becomes under siege. Lepage volunteers to go fight for his country. In the trenches, a shell strikes nearby, and a chunk of earth hits Lepage in the chest, hospitalizing him and punishing him to a confinement of staying in his family home among the peasants where he grew up for the next year of his life. But it's in this reconnection with his childhood that Lepage begins to look at life differently differently. He had been to Paris, he had studied the Roman and Greek ideals, he had learned the classics, but he had never painted from his own ideals. Lepage begins to look at the world around him differently. A high stone wall shielded one half of the family yard. Inside of it, fruit trees and a small garden his grandfather kept. It was in this garden that Lepage would paint his first masterwork, a portrait of his grandfather with the light filtering through a canopy of the fruit trees, leaving all to be illuminated and sparing no details. This portrait that featured a sincerity and honesty of Lepage's life would place first in the next salon, and the Lepage name previously unknown a day before now had a home in the heart of Paris. It was with the same self-assurance that Lepage would now compete for the greatest prize in painting, the Prix de Rome. This is where the best painters in the world would compete for a scholarship to go to Rome. The painters would be given a topic. This year's was the Annunciation of Christ to the Shepherds, and they all had to make sketches in isolation with no reference. The best 10 sketches move on to the next stage. Each day, Lepage arrives at the academy, where he's padded down, and anything that doesn't have the official seal of the competition is not 
allowed into his studio. And then he is locked in his studio until sunset. This is his life for the next three months. Each night, Lepage meets his friend Julian Alden Weir in a cafe to discuss his work. There's one thing that troubles Jules very deeply. The painting is set to take place in the dead of night when the angels come to meet the shepherds. And to Lepage, there is a unpaintable quality of night. One night, Jules comes to Julian and explains to him that he would change the composition to take place just at the crack of dawn when the color of objects is just barely visible and he keeps updating Julian on this every night as he brings his paintings and sketches to him to see. If you make a change too great to your original sketch you would be disqualified. But despite this small change everything proceeds very well and the painting slowly starts to take on the form of flesh and those three months melt away. The day of the Prix de Rome judging is here. In the early morning sunlight, a crowd forms outside the gate of the Academy of Fine Arts. The Parisians are ready to see the winner of the Prix de Rome. Within minutes of the gate's opening, Lepage's painting is surrounded by a crowd, buzzing with approval as the nine other canvases there on display seem to disappear into a mist. Everyone is focused on Lepage. Lepage's painting was different from the other entrants. Maybe it was Bastian's limited studying at the Academy before his injury, but Lepage Lepage's style was not the typical academic style. It was familiar and touching as if it had just left the page of a illuminated Bible. The visit of the angel surprises the shepherds sleeping by their open fire, and the eldest of them is kneeling in reverence before this apparition. The youngest man is gazing with half-closed eyes and his open lips and hands. The angel has all the beauty of youth and femininity and holds an outstretched arm to the shepherds. The flattened halo behind her references Italo Byzantine style artwork. No part of the canvas is left untouched by the masterful hand of Lepage. There is a graphic quality that we can almost find a modern about this work. Its design is timeless, sensitive, and honest, the hallmarks of its maker. Yet the jury decided otherwise. A man named Khmer had taken the first place prize. With his more traditional draftsmanship and correct nature to his work. It was Lepage's decision to change the scene from the dead of night to dawn that cost him the prize. In the eyes of the purest jurors, there was to be no changes made to the original prompt. Despite Jerome's support for Lepage, his victory was stolen. It was Khmer who would travel to Villa Medici in Rome and receive the financial support of the French government. I learned my business in Paris. I shall not forget that, but my art I did not learn there. I should be sorry to undervalue the high qualities and the devotion of the masters who direct the school, but is it my fault that I have found in their studios the only doubts that have tormented me? In the school I have drawn gods and goddesses, Greeks and Romans, that I knew nothing about, that I did not understand, and even laughed at. I wonder sometimes if anything has resulted from this education. Lepage competes again in the next Brita Realm, but this time his heart is not in it. He does it to placate his friends and family. The results of this painting are underrealized. It's a bit strange, and while there are parts of it that are beautiful, it's clear that his mind was occupied elsewhere. He was combing back the memories of his life, unpacking and recontextualizing. The techniques of his masters were not his techniques. The ideals of his masters were not his ideals. His true ideals were in front of him his whole life. They were the laborers driving the plows across the field, the ones whose backs are curved with the labors of their hoes. That is what Lepage did from that day on. He painted his story not the story of others. He had dreams now of painting the haymakers, harvesters, cedars, lovers, and the burial of a young girl. He had the radical idea to paint Joan of Arc as a peasant woman, to which he fully realized. This tree is the same one that filtered the light of his grandfather's portrait. He became his own master from that day forward. If Lepage's story was one marred with early success, who knows if he would have found his true meaning in painting. If you guys like this video, please leave a like and a comment below. I'm, I'm new to YouTube, this stuff really helps me out. I just made a new Discord server. If you want to learn to become a better painter or engage with other people who are into this art history, I also teach art mentorships. If you want to be art block or learn the fundamentals of art, all that stuff in the link below.